Thank you, Bishop Soria. I have an update. We have one and a half grandchildren. <laughs> well, so right. we get to be, yeah, <laughs> we get to do this again. So we are very grateful for that. Thank you, President Hori, for your really personal warm remarks um, that you always share with us. Let me begin, but I'll need permission to share, please. If I can get permission from the, okay. And Welcome to the joint online fellowship between the World Christian Leadership Conference and the Pacific Christian Leadership Conference. John 10, 17. For this reason, my father loves me, is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. Jesse Edwards is uh, recorded a message, so if he cannot make it online, I, I'm sure he will continue to try. Uh, we have his message with us. We're very grateful and honored to have him with us. He is the national evangelist. And to the pastors who have been introduced and will be introduced, thank you for your prayers for peace. Our topic today is understanding the crucifixion today. The divine principle, the teaching of Father Moon says, salvation of humanity was possible only through the shedding, the blood of his only begotten son on the cross. In another version of the same teaching, it says, without the cross, Christianity would not have brought forth its illustrious history. When Christians look at the cross, we know the verse that is quoted repeatedly, John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. When Father Moon looks at this verse, he has a feeling that something is missing. Yes, God loved the world. Yes, Jesus was sacrificed. Yes, if we believe in him, we will have eternal life. But it's not a unilateral event. Where is the participation of Jesus in this monumentous offering? The crucifixion was a partnership, and Jesus was full partner in that process. A partnership with God. There was a partnership between God and the Jewish people. This is where it started, and that was called a covenant. A covenant is a partnership. And according to the Jewish Museum in London, the covenant is a promise that God made with Abraham. According to the covenant, God would offer protection and land to Abraham and his descendants, but they must follow the path of God. God then commanded Abraham and his future generations to perform the rite of circumcision, Brit Milah, as a symbol of the covenant. So the circumcision was not the covenant, it was a symbol. The responsibility of the covenant is to follow the path of God. This verse in Hebrews must awaken us to historical meaning to the crucifixion. Hebrews 8, 7. For if that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion for a second. If I paraphrase it, it would be something like this. There was a fault in the first covenant, in the first partnership. Therefore, a second or new covenant, a new partnership became necessary. Well, two questions arise based on this Hebrews verse. What was the first covenant? And what was the fault? And the second question, what is the second covenant? And why does the crucifixion compensate, or the word that we often use is indemnify, means to cover and repay that fault? Let's answer the first question first. What was the first covenant and what was the fault? The first covenant 
was clear. God had a responsibility in the process of restoration. He must prepare and send the Messiah. That because of the fall, now the necessity to send Jesus as the Messiah became absolutely central to God's providence of restoration. The responsibility of the Jewish people was to work with God. So they did. They helped prepare the foundation. And God worked in this history particularly. He worked globally, but in this, there was a special effort because they were preparing the foundation for the Messiah. And the second responsibility of the Jewish people, if God sends the Messiah, they should receive him because they're making the preparation for him. So for 4,000 years, we don't have time now, but please, if you have an opportunity, study Father Moon's history of restoration. It's amazing in terms of the parallel and the providence that is happening. It's like the DNA of human history. For 4,000 years, God worked to prepare for the Messiah. And the Jewish people were partner and were successful in laying that foundation. But then something happened. There was a fault. There was a transgression. And Isaiah 53, 5 tells us he was pierced for our transgression. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. Well, what was that transgression? Isaiah 53, 3, two verses earlier, explains clearly. He was despised and rejected by mankind. A man of suffering and familiar with pain, like one from whom people hid their face. He was despised and we held him in low esteem. Wow. So if God sends the Messiah and the Jewish people are supposed to receive him and instead they despise and reject, huge problems can occur. So this is a warning to the Jewish people. And in one verse earlier, 53.2, he grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. So when God sends the Messiah, well, it looks like externally just an ordinary man. And yet the expectations of some of the Jewish people was that he will be extraordinary, maybe in the way he comes or the way he'll appear or what he might do. So this expectation, we must be very careful, very careful. In Psalms, it talks about it again, the stone the builders rejected, he was rejected, has become the cornerstone. The stone is Christ, it's Jesus. The builders are the Jewish people. And the stone that was rejected became the cornerstone, became the crucifixion. That's the crucified Jesus. So the partnership that God was working with the Jewish people for 4,000 years to prepare and send the Messiah, the partnership, the covenant, was broken. The second question. What was the second covenant and why does the crucifixion compensate or cover or indemnify that fault? The second covenant in Matthew 26, 28. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Luke 22, 20. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. So clearly, the crucifixion of Jesus has tremendous value in rebuilding this covenantal relationship with God. So the value of Jesus shedding his blood on the cross. When Jesus was despised and rejected, his public ministry was virtually impossible. He was shunned and kind of like an outcast, ostracized. But he kept telling the Jewish people, they asked him, what must we do to do the work God requires? Jesus answered, the work of God is this, you believe in him 
whom he has sent. Believe, believe, believe. Please don't reject. Not only that, the 4,000 year Jewish history that laid the foundation for the Messiah could also be claimed by Satan. It was in that jeopardy because that's the fruit of the 4,000 years is the Messiah. And if the Jewish people reject and despise, then it means they are not doing the will of God. Even worse, God's future providence might be in danger. God has to make an extraordinary sacrifice. This 4,000 year foundation history for the Messiah. Well, Jesus' life on the cross protects the 4,000 year, re recovers that, that, that covenant that was broken, restores that relationship with God. Jesus' sacrifice on the cross protected the foundation for the Messiah, that 4,000 years of history. It also allows God's providence to continue, thereby opening the path for God's worldwide providence centering on Christianity. Why? Why does the cross do that? Because the Jewish people, their covenant is to follow God. That's, that's the covenantal relationship, the responsibility of the Jewish people. So if God's will is to send the Messiah and that he be received, then that's the Jewish people's responsibility as well. Then what happened? Because he was despised and rejected. This is the participation that Jesus played in the crucifixion. And Father Moon loves Jesus so much. And he felt it's missing. If we just quote John 3.16, John 3.16, John 3.16 then we miss the participation of Jesus, the willing full partnership of Jesus on the cross. Yes, God made the sacrifice, but yes, also Jesus was a partner in that sacrifice. For this reason, the Father loves me. Because I lay down my life, no one takes it from me but I lay it down of my own accord. This charge I have received from my father. So Jesus was united with God in heart when he voluntarily went to the way of the cross. So the victory of the cross, not just to die on the cross, but to die willingly, to die voluntarily, without hesitation, prematurely, to die in the cruelest manner possible, to die without resentment, to die forgiving those who crucified him. This is the victory. This is the partnership that Jesus added to God's sacrifice. The new covenant, the new partnership, God has a responsibility, and we know what that is. John 3.16, God Loved the world. He had to make this sacrifice. He prepared 4,000 years to send the Messiah. But if he's rejected, then this sacrifice becomes necessary. God so loved the world. He would not allow his providence to end at that moment. He gave his only begotten son. Jesus' responsibility. For this reason, the Father loves me because I lay down my life of my own accord. This is the new covenant. This is the new partnership. So not only the cross protects the 4,000 years, it opens up God's world level providence. So we've got the family level and the national level. Again, we don't have time to go into the details. I apologize for that. But through the crucifixion, then God protected that foundation and built a world level foundation centering on Christianity. So John 3.16 plus John 10, 17, and 18. The family level, the national level, and the world level. The cross is the new covenant that allowed God to continue. God so loved the world. God loved the world. He wanted his providence to extend to the world level. 
Jesus' willing participation of the sacrifice made that possible. The new partnership, the covenant was restored. God so loved the world. Yes, he gave his only son. And Jesus, a full partner in that sacrifice, I lay down my life of my own accord. For if the first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion for a second. That's what Hebrews said. Now we understand more deeply the value and meaning and the full participation that Jesus had. Was Jesus' crucifixion absolutely predestined? Well, some people think so, and they'll quote Hebrews 9.22. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. But let's look at the entire verse, 9.22. In fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. So, in fact, it doesn't say blood is always required. Usually it is because there are so many failures and then things that need to be covered or indemnified. And some people will say, well, yeah, but it, it comes from the animal sacrifice in the Old Testament. Oh, really? Let's look more clearly. Two animals were sacrificed. Not just the animal that was killed and its blood was shed. Aaron shall bring the goat whose lot falls to the Lord and sacrifice it for a sin offering. But the goat chosen by Lot as the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to be used for making atonement by sending it into the wilderness as a scapegoat. So yes, blood is sadly often needed, but not absolutely. So lessons learned. God works in partnerships. Jesus did not appear physically different from the other people, and this may have been one of the main reasons why they didn't recognize him so easily. In Christianity, we have two covenants. One is between Jesus and God, and the other is between us and Jesus. So thank you so much for your time as we look forward to this Christian celebration. Let us rethink not just the sacrifice that God made, but the sacrifice that Jesus fully participated in that crucifixion. Thank you, and God bless. Amazing, amazing grace from God. Thank you, Dr. Robert Kittle, for your thought-provoking message. Before we will continue, we would like to recognize the participation of the members of the World Christian Leadership Conference. They are all online now. Now, Bishop Jesse Edwards is connected. Together with him, from WCLC, Reverend Bruce Grudner and Dr. Tanya Edwards. Let's welcome all of them. Also, we would like to recognize the participation of 12 pastors from Metro Tagbilaran Evangelical Association of Ministries Incorporated, Bohol, Philippines. Thank you. Now, let us continue to our second speaker is Bishop Jesse Edwards, who is with the Executive Committee of the American Clergy Leadership Conference. He is the founder of four churches and is a prominent national leader in the Pentecostal movement and co-pastored with his wife, the Pentecostals of Philadelphia Church. He is a national evangelist focusing on marriage and family. He holds a doctorate in theology. Bishop Edwards led pilgrimages to the Holy Land and into the Gaza Strip, promoting peace and ending conflict between Christians, Jews, and Muslims. 
He and his wife have four children and ten grandchildren. Let us welcome Bishop Jesse Edwards to the platform with a big round of virtual applause. Praise God, everyone. Today, our discussion is understanding the crucifixion today. We're reading in scripture of St. John chapter 10, verse 17 and 18. For the Father loves me because I sacrifice my life. So I also may bring it back again. No one can take my life from me. He says, I sacrifice it voluntarily, for I have the authority to lay it down. And when I'm ready to also take it up again, for this is the will of my father. The key thought I want to talk about today is the fact that Jesus didn't just die. No, Jesus died with power and authority. His life wasn't taken. Jesus said this himself. I lay it down willingly to die for all the sins of humanity. His crucifixion was an apparent defeat to him. However, nothing like the defeat that Satan had because it won a victory for God and post an eternal uh, failure for the archangel. The cross is the power of God demonstrated in humanity, the man, Christ Jesus. The cross today is our glory. It's the glory. When I look at a cross, I don't think of the crucifixion. I'm thankful for it. But I think of the glory that we have today because of the cross. Now, when I say the cross, Notice, I'm talking about the historical fact of Jesus' crucifixion and his resurrection. I asked because lately I've been wondering if the cross as a symbol still means anything to the average person, either a Christian or otherwise. It's on the church sign, it's on the billboards, it's on the wall of our church, it's on uh, everywhere we go. It's incorporated into the logos of, of books, uh, checkbooks, music CDs. And if anyone was to ask today what the symbol of Christianity would be, of course, it would be a cross. The cross was used as a symbol. This symbol carries with it, all sorts of conflicting messages today. But it's not just the church that makes ample use of the cross symbol. Listen to this. Kanye, Kanye West and Madonna in the latest of all Hollywood have used the cross in, in the time of, of imagery to make confused comparisons of themselves to Jesus. The cross image is so common today that I can no longer really figure out exactly what people see and what they feel, even if it's uh, desecrated or it is supposed to mean it has a meaning to it. Has the cross reached this date and this state of time when it's so complicated that it's no real value or of wealth as a symbol in America's 21st century. When you see a cross in a church or a museum, anywhere, what do you feel? Do you feel sorrow, humility, worshipfulness, annoyance, anger, or nothing at all? Has it retained its symbolic power and majesty after so many years of use and misuse? 
Has it retained its symbol of power, of anointing and the resurrection? What do you think? Or am I on to something? Or am I overreacting? Am I right? Is it too late for the, for, to restore the meaning of the cross in our hearts, in our lives, in our walk with God? Years have gone by, and or is it now just a decoration? I, I was in a part store today uh, ordering a part for the car, and a young man had a cross around his neck with Jesus still on the cross. And I really didn't say anything to him, but my Jesus is not on the cross. He's resurrected. He's alive in the spirit world. So our history of bringing excess baggage actually gets in the way with our meditation of Christ's sacrifice. Wow. The cross means so much to those that have an experience with our father. Here's what Jesus was saying. Three times in these two verses, the word I take has appeared. I always study the Bible with uh, other books here. I have a Greek, I have a Hebrew, I have uh, a lot of lexicons here. They give me understanding because you must realize that in translation, you lose some of its meaning. When Jesus says, I lay my life down, he did have the power to lay his life down. He had the power to give it. No man had the right or the power to take it from him. He was the only one. I, I, I read a scripture that said he could have called 10,000 angels to take him off the cross and set him free. But he died alone for our sins, for you and for me. And then he says, when I lay my life down, it says, I take it up again. That word take, the second part, the Greek word does not mean take. It means receive. Jesus says, I take it up and I receive it. I take my life to the cross, but I receive life from whom? Our heavenly parent, our heavenly father. In the spirit realm. You see, when a physical body dies, it has no power of resurrection, it has no power to bring itself back up. Now, Jesus was going to resurrect because he told them, destroy this temple. And in three days, it'll be resurrected again. What would we talk about? We're talking about covenant relationship with our maker. Covenant relationship with God. Jesus had a contract. He lived faithful. He walked faithful. He was fruitful. He multiplied. He was at the point to have dominion. Oh, if he could have just had a family, wife, children, he could have changed lineage 2,000 years ago. He could have had a family that was pure, sinless, and spotless. Imagine Jesus was without sin. If he had a son, his son would have been without sin. His grandson without sin. Imagine 2,000 years of humanity not born in sin and shaping in iniquity. This contract that Jesus had was, Father, I will do your will, but you will resurrect me on the third day. Very similar to Adam in the garden. Jesus uh, represented the second Adam. Adam in the garden was the first Adam. The first Adam had a contract with God. The contract read like this. Adam, if you be fruitful, you multiply and you will grow to dominion as you mature. You can have everything in the garden that you want. Matter of fact, I'm going to show you the partnership that Adam and God had. The agreement, the contract that Adam had with God. God even allowed Adam to name all the animals of the garden. It's like God was saying, Adam, I'll create them. But our partnership says that you're going to name them. You're going to take care of them. From now on, you are going to be the one who has dominion over all of my creation. What an agreement with God and man. Now, that could have been totally fulfilled if Adam would have just continued to walk. Every day, God comes down in the garden and communes with Adam. 
and is teaching him to be the dresser of the vineyard, to be the Messiah to all mankind. But Adam was weak. He gave in to the words of Lucifer, eat of the fruit. Oh, but God said, if we eat of this fruit, we shall surely die. Now, Lucifer knew they weren't going to die physically, but they were going to die spiritually. But he didn't explain that to them. Notice what he did say to Eve. Don't you know, Eve, that the day that you eat of this tree, you will be like God. You become God's because now you have knowledge of good and evil. If Adam and Eve would have just been faithful to God, they would have understood knowledge through their experience. But now they're seeing knowledge of evil through failure, through fault, through disobedience. What an agreement. What a contract. Wow, that God had with Adam. I'm so thankful today that I know what the cross means to me. It means that I had a savior who loved me so much, willing to give his life for you and for me. He died for our sins. He gave his life's blood and God resurrected him the third day. And now he is on the throne waiting to share that throne with us. So if we believe in him, trust in him, walk with him, that cross becomes a powerful, powerful, powerful symbol of victory, not destruction, not death, not evil as it looked in that day, but victory over death, victory over sin, victory over the archangel, and restoration to the first Adam in the Garden of Eden. May God bless you today and add to his word knowledge and understanding. God bless.